Nico. Thank you, Jens. Thank you, Jens. Welcome to the conference. Thank you. And now we're ready. Now we are ready. <laughs> awesome. Let's see what happens. Um, first of all, thank you, Jens, that I'm allowed to put the little sign on the left top. It's very important for me. I have friends in Kiev. I have also friends in Russia. Um, there was one conference where I had a problem with the code of conduct team because of that. <laughs> so maybe our value system is sometimes interesting in this world. But today, let's talk about C++. And, and those who know me know that I, I care for more than 25 years now. I, I don't invent. I usually document and teach. And as, if you write books, you are an early adapter of something new. And that means you think about things, how to teach them. Is this good design? Is this bad design? I'm involved into the standard committee for years now. Also, with support of ThinkCell, I'm part of their problem, no, of their solution. And, um, but we have 200 people now standardizing C++. Awesome people, great experts, with a lot of heart and a lot of care. I have to say that, because you might get in this talk the impression that I don't like them. <laughs> so it's already a case of code of conduct. <laughs> and then, but no, that's not true. I think we are a great group. You learn how to work together and to make something together. But I also see an issue. And the issue is if 200 experts work together on the rush and they do so many stuff as we do, sometimes things have a problem. So in this keynote, we will see a couple of things, uh, good things and maybe bad things. And first of all, I have to change the title. I don't want to talk about the devil in the detail. I, don't, I want to talk about the shaman. And you will see later on why. When C++ 20 came out, we uh, could do a lot of things we couldn't do before. Partially, I learned them the hard way when I, when I wrote the book, which just two weeks ago was done. So let's look, first of all, what is possible now. And my example is, let's init a range with some random numbers. So let's see, we have a vector of um, eight elements. The zero initialization makes eight elements all zero. And um, then let's call a function. And the function should add some random values to, this, um, to these elements. OK. So let's iterate over the values and call a function random and add the result to v, to the element. And what is random? Well, random is, in fact, part of the C++ random library, where you could define a distribution of values from 1 to 99 um, using a random engine initialized or seeded with a random device. And that's it. That's it. That's C++ 11 stuff, nothing new. So something like that is the output. Good. And C++ 17, we introduce a class template argument deduction. If you look in the middle, in the declaration of random, you can see that um, we no longer need the type in there. Good. And now, let's look 
at some uh, things. Can we improve things here? And the first thing we can improve is something. If, if you do, start to do that, you immediately are lost and say, I cannot roll back. And what I'm talking about, look at the top of this function. And look at this change. Let's declare the template parameter, not as a template parameter, um, auto. Let's use auto here. And, and it's really fun. I, I, gave a, I gave a training on Tuesday, and, and we talked about generic lambdas. And I told them, and he asked them, oh, what, what is this, all this stuff with templates? And they are so complicated. And, and I, I told them, have you used lambdas with auto? Yeah. OK, you use templates. Oh, really? And, and this is the way that we can write templates now. It's still a template. You can explicitly specify the type that auto represents. But it's just nicer. OK. So let's um, use this function in some other context. Um, let's use a queue. Well, if you have ever done that, pass a queue to a function that expects a range to iterate over, you might come up with a surprise, which is um, you get some crazy error message. The craziness of the error message depends on what you do and how deep your code goes, um, because Queues don't have begin and end. It's not a range. So you get some error message. And the error message points you right in the middle of random math or functions that are called there. So C20 gave us its feature to say, well, you know, we can constrain this template. We can say this template is only appropriate if, we, um, if you give me something that is um, a range there where we can forward over and um, yeah, modify the elements, et cetera. So a forward range. And we you can write that as a type constraint directly in front of auto. Most of you will know that, maybe not everybody. And as a result, um, you get a nice error message even without looking into the function um, body. And the compiler will tell you, well, the constraint is not satisfied. We have a problem here. Compilers still work on that. They're getting better and better. Um, give them still a little bit of time to get with really good error messages here. So now we can say, OK, uh, let's try out to do something strange, which is let's um, initialize or add a random value to a vector of strings. The first guy is shocked by that. <laughs> Who thinks that this compiles? Who knows that this does not compile? Oh, a couple of people who will raise their hand, one, two, three, four, are in the standard committee, and they are wrong. <sighs> because, yes, a random value that is an int can be used as a character and can be added to a string. Hey, people, what are you standardizing? <laughs> this works. And depending on the value of the random number generator, you might get after tic-tac-toe a visible or non-visible character having nice effects. That's not good. Can we fix that? Yes, you just saw. We can constrain templates with C++ 20. So let's do that here. So how do we do that? Um, let's put another constraint. Now, not just qualifying the parameter. Now, constraining explicitly, let's require that the value type of the elements, so the element type of what we pass as a range, so we take decal type of the values, and then the value type, uh, we need a type name there, and then um, let's require that this is an integral value. And that's what you write there. And suddenly, you get an error message 
Well, you also get an error message for the first call. Why? Look at what we call on top of this slide. We call decal type of what we have as a parameter, so vels, decal type of vels, colon, colon, value type. What is vels? Vels is a reference. So that's not valid code. So if this requirement is not fulfilled, a funny side effect, if you have another, another random add, that could be used instead, that might be taken now, because the require says, if this is not valid, well, we don't use that. <laughs> okay. So that's not the way you have to do it. You have to do it that way. Um, we have a new type trait that says, oh, um, please, bef when you take the type of valves, remove um, constantness, volatileness, and referenceness. Well, in this case, constantness and volatileness is not there, but anyway, this is a new type trait I wanted to show you. And um, so this is the whole expression. Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. And you get a nice error message saying, the constraint integral is not satisfied when you call random add for the words, for the vector of strings. Can we do it better? Yeah, we can do it better. So one thing is that the whole problem that we well, have to call decal type of vaults and then remove CVREF is that we don't have the type as it is without constant referenceness. But, but we have it to some extent. That's what auto represents. So in this case, auto is not the best idea. Let's go back to use templates parameter. Boo, boo. But yes, we still sometimes need them. Uh, so let's introduce a template parameter that is the type of the range. Use it, introduce it, and use it in the declaration, and then, then say, OK, let's require that we, this is a forward range and that the value type of it is an integral value. Good. Better. Uh, can we improve that? Oh, yes. Look at the top. Look at the type name. So the way we could constrain auto, we could also, can also constrain a template parameter now. So instead of writing type name, we can say, OK, um, RGT must be a forward range. So we have it on top. We have the, for the type RGT, which we use a couple of times. Forward range as a requirement. We have another requirement saying, um, the value type has to be an integral type. And yeah, now that it, it, it starts to look OK, I would say. Um, we have a special kind of ranges supported for years in C++, which are raw arrays. So does it work for raw arrays? Oh, no. Um, yeah, because raw arrays have no member value type. Hmm. So, but here we also have something, and that also comes with C++ with the rangeless library that says, well, instead of using value type, use a general utility we provide to say, well, let's use the value type of a range. Well, there are two ranges there. So in the rangeless library, there's for range the value type, and then you pass the range you have. And by the way, this can deal with if you pass um, a reference or so. So I could also pass here decal type of something, of what. Okay, and now suddenly, in this code, we support raw arrays. Awesome. Can we improve the whole code? Can, we, can, can I show you something more about C++20? Um, yes. Let's use threads. So let's uh, put the whole initialization into a function, into a local function. So we use a lambda for that. And then um, start five threads calling this function. So let's um, create a vector of threads and um, five times push back a thread that is calling this lambda. Well, oh, oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> well, now even those in the standard libraries saw some trouble. <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. They're great. Um, concurrent writes. 
<laughs> That's not a good idea, what we have here. But we have another problem. We have a cutter. Because um, there's a problem with threats. If you have threats and you don't join them before the destructor is called, you get a cutter. So at the end, you have to write a loop that iterates over the threads and calls join for them. Oh, and you have to deal with exception handling because you might not come to your loop at the end. And um, oh, may, what happens in, if we have an exception? How can we signal that all the threads should no longer run? Um, these things were not solved. We, we knew that they were not solved. And um, it's, it's a little bit funny. I, I, I've made a couple of proposals for C++, but they were all fixes. <laughs> Nothing new. <laughs> and um, so I drove this, and it's called jthread. J does not stand for Yosutis. J <laughs> does stand for joining thread. And, um, and also not for Java, I should say. And with that, we have a nice feature now in C20 says, look, let's iterate over all the threads well, and join them. No, you don't have to do that anymore because the destructor does it for you. Um, so even if you have an exception, we wait for the threads, which might not be good because we wait forever. Well, in this case, not. But uh, how can we say, oh, if there's an exception, stop? Well. Part of this feature, part of jthread, is stop tokens. And you can say, OK, um, give me an optional additional parameter. You see there was none. Well, even if you have some, just put a first new argument there, stop token. And if you have that to stop token, you have something where you can establish a co cooperative way to deal with problems that signal stop thread. No longer wait. The problem is you cannot kill threads. It's not a process. We have not a process scheduler cleaning up things, etc. If you kill a thread, you either cannot do that, or if you can do that, you run into really a strange state of your program. So you need cooperation. And this is done by jthread. jthread will, at the end, implicitly call not only join. It will, before it calls join, it will say, hey, no, stop. And, but the thread has to um, cooperate and say, oh, from time to time, I'm looking, is there a stop requested? And if so, I, I don't continue. There are other ways to do that. You can, uh, you can um, add a callback that is called in that moment. You can even um, establish a stop token and pass it to a condition variable. So if the thread is asleep, that the sleep is interrupted to uh, stop the thread. So things like that came. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that we have that. It's not, I, I only drove that. I, I, I didn't program that. A lot of people program that. I, I saw all the problems we fixed with that. Um, if you do it on your own, um, it's a nightmare to do it right, because concurrency in general is a, is a nightmare. A lot of things can happen. OK, so we have this code. Ah, and then we have concurrent access. Um, concurrent access to the values in the vector by five threads, that's not a good idea. So how can we protect that? Well, we need something like mutexes or Tamex or something like that. Well, we have something new in C++20, which is a temporary atomic. We call that um, atomic reference. And if you do that, um, it's enough to fix the code as follows, as you see it here, to say, well, let's, let's Let's create an atomic reference V here. So V is already there, but we make it temporarily atomic. And of course, all, each and every thread that might um, deal with that at the same time has to do with that. But then this code is safe. And you, and you see, you don't have to share the atomic reference with the other threads. Each thread can make it an atomic reference itself and by some mechanism that, yeah, that use global tables, um, they, we have make this V atomic inside this loop, but not for the whole program. So temporarily atomic. 
only in this context. And done. We're done. It works. Well, that's applause for those who, prov pro uh, who provided all the, all the stuff used here. We have concepts. We have constraints. We have auto. You can qualify. Well, you don't see it anymore. Atomic references, J threads. Um, oh, uh, there was one more thing. Views. Here's my function again. I skip the body now. But it's still a function that adds a random value to all the past, all the elements of the past range. OK, if we have a vector of 8 in, this will work fine and initialize all the values. Can print that out? Great. What we can do with views is we can create a view on a range, which is not a new range. We can say, oh, let, let's take a subset. Let's take a transformation of the values in the container. Let's take the elements reserve, a reverse, and um, things like that. So you can do this. You can say, oh, uh, let's, let's initialize another vector of 8 in, but let's only add random values to all the elements, um, but only take the first five of them by using this pipe symbol. And if you print that out, you get that as an output. Well, as a possible output, it's a random values. And that way, you can, you can create pipes like that and combine even with, with, with simple building blocks. You can combine and create multiple more complicated stuff like this. You can say, OK, let's, um, let's um, get a value, how many elements should we skip? So let's skip two of them. So let's um, initialize in another, yet another vector, let's initialize the, um, each element, the five elements after the first two elements which we skip. And then um, this is the result. How cool is that? And I just switched to list here. Ah, I have a vector, now list, partial. How cool is that? Those who come from Unix know about the power of using little building blocks to create really interesting complexity uh, very fast and easy. So, time to program. This should be a fun session, and I have to prove what I teach you, that everything runs. So, we have to program. So this is the code you just see. I hope. Yeah, it looks like that. A lot of header files were missing. <laughs> OK. Um, let's compile. Where do I have it? Maybe here? Yeah, that looks good. Oh, it was. You didn't see what you saw there. It's clear. But. <laughs> so, should I make it a little bit larger in the back for the back? Yeah, OK. Why don't you say anything? So, uh, better or still larger? Oh. I want to sponsor my talks by some Eye doctors, I think. OK, bad, good? So, OK, we keep it. OK. Make proc 0. Oh, oh, <laughs> that's, that's a standard GCC compiler. I should use a 20 mode. OK. Good. Compiles. At least it compiles. So does it also work? Well, uh, I have um, commanded out print, and um, so we have to implement print, but that I thought is something we can do together. 
So um, yeah, obviously we have to write a print function. Um, obviously, the print function returns nothing. And um, oh, we have this new cool auto feature. So auto, and um, oh, do we modify the um, values? Const auto reference. Why is that green? Okay, good. Collection. Um, so that's my collection. And um, oh, I should look here, that's easier. <laughs> um, so let's, um, it's so painful to type in front of 500 people. Um, for each element, for each const auto reference, well, okay, we know it's in, let's, let's make it more generic. Um, each element in this collection. Um, let's print out the element. Um, what? What? Oh. <laughs> what is all? Oh? You want you want me to use a new format library? Yeah. It's not supported everywhere yet. I hope it's coming soon. Uh, well, it's, unfortunately, uh, is it now in GCC? I don't. It is. Oh, I should. Uh, well, uh, if you wait a moment, I will rebuild my local system GCC. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll we continue. So, okay, we use it. Good. So, does this code compile? What do you think? Why not? What doesn't exist? Line 46. Oh, yeah. You, you know, last minute changes in a talk are really a problem. Um, and, wait, say it, and, it's okay or not? Okay. We will see. Yeah, I mean, that's why we have a compiler. <laughs> good. <laughs> Looks good. Proc 1. Oh, awesome. That's it. Done. <laughs> Who has learned anything new so far? No, nobody. <laughs> good. So I, I could have skipped the whole thing. Yeah, I see. I got the message. Um, oh, let, let's let's use oh let's let's make some fun. Let's um, print out here how many elements we have. No. So we have the values. Um, so we have um, val dot size. Oh no, we don't use dot size. We you choose your nice utilities from the ranges library. So std ranges size for vowels. Elams. Okay. Does the code compile? No, they say but they are wrong. <laughs> it compiles. All good. So let's modify the code a little bit and add yet another view. And for example, say um, this time, I want to um, wanna have a v4, which is, um, let's take list three again, and then um, let's use a filter and filter. And uh, what what do we want to filter? Let's um, let's have a, a predicate greater zero. Um, if it's greater than zero, that's simply to type. Let's say um, for each const auto reference value return whether the value is greater than zero. Um, oh, it looks like, okay. So, 
let's um, init that v4 and see what's happening. So does it compile? No. Why? Why not? Well, it, yeah, this has no size. Yeah, and you get an easy error message. <laughs> you, know, you know what I did in my trainings, and it's really helpful. I, whenever I teach, I turn on the flag. Um, where is it? F max errors equals one. Mm -hmm. So that you only see one error message of, of 200 lines and not anything else. So the problem is we have no size. Yeah, we have no size. And why do we have no size? We have to look at that. So here's the problem. Assume I have a vector and I call drop. So drop for a vector is cheap. You, if you define a view like that, you say, OK, let's call begin. And begin is, is constant. Um, you can easily compute where the first element is with this view, because you just can compute, let's go to the first element in the vector and then jump ahead three elements. That's um, not possible if it's a list. If it's a list, you cannot jump ahead three elements. So you have to um, iterate three times. And things like that happen if you use a filter. If you use a filter, you cannot, and you say, um, let's go to the first element. You have to look at each and every element, whether it fits or not, to decide which is the first element. So which one is the begin of the view. So that means um, for a vector and then filter or uh, then um, a view on a vector with drop, begin is a very fast operation. For a list and a drop, it's a it's a slow operation. It's a it's it depends on the on the number of elements you drop. Um, empty, is it empty? Is fast? for a vector, a, a, a drop on a vector, because it's just a computation. It's a, it's a size of the vector um, bigger than the number of elements I drop. Um, you can compute size fast. You can use the index, uh, jump to a specific element fast. Everything is fast, so that's fine. But if you use drop on a list, then things become expensive, sometimes. So um, empty is easy. Size is easy, because you can also always ask, um, what is the count size, and then see whether we skip how many, depending on how many elements we skip, whether we are this, what is the result. But uh, to jump to an nth element, we, um, yeah, we have to iterate. And so we don't provide that. And the same is for filter. We don't. Well, everything is slow with a filter. <laughs> well, even, even begin is slow. Because, um, yeah, you have to iterate over all elements until you find the first element that where the predicate you pass is true. Um, empty is therefore also slow. Size is slow. The index operator is slow. So you know that from C++. We don't provide slow functions. Well, wait a minute. Um, if, we, if we don't provide begin, we have a problem <laughs> with a view. It's slow, but that's the nature of the game. So the result is that size and the index operator is not available if you use a filter. But empty is, for example, available, and begin is also available. So, but then the designers of the library thought, um, but can we improve the situation? And, the, and then they came up with the following. They said, OK, you know, when I have a vector and I call drop, it's, it's cheap. It's always cheap. So that nothing to do there. But if we have a list and, and, and we call begin, uh, once we have begin, that might be a, 
a linear computation, depending on the number of elements we drop. And the same as um, if we use a filter, depending on the predicate. Um, yeah, let's see. So they cache begin. Cool idea. Once we have computed begin, let's cache it. So next time you use begin again, we have it. It doesn't take us anymore the same time. So we have some views that cache. Uh, filter caches always drop sometimes, depending on whether under the hood there's a random access range or a list range. OK. As a result, you have this behavior. So you can uh, see that um, if I call vec drop or list drop, um, the first begin is constant, and then the second begin is constant. But for list drop, the fourth line, the first begin is linear, and then the next is constant. Um, and the same is true for empty. The first empty is linear, and the next is constant, unless we have called begin already, because big empty needs just begin. And, um, and size we don't provide, which is a little bit funny, because from a complexity point of view, size is as slow as empty, but OK. Um, why do we do that? Well, that, there's a good reason for that, because um, we have a requirement in the standard. We say, to require that something is a range, you we, it is required that begin and end is cheap. And it is stated in the standard. They say, this is little quoting. Um, if you have a type T, it models a range only, so a concept range only, if begin and end have amortized constant time. So the trick is amortized here. Well, because it's not constant, obviously it, it cannot be constant. But it's amortized constant. We have that already. We know that from vectors where we say, well, you know, pushing an element at the end, adding an, inserting an element at the end is amortized constant time because Sometimes you have to reserve new memory, but um, that pays off because over time you, you added more memory for 50 new elements and the next 49 elements are cheap to insert. That's a little bit tr interesting that we, but that we say we have the same situation here because obviously the first call of begin is linear. So it would only pay off if, if, we, if we have a filter that has 100 elements, we would only get amortized constant complexity if we then iterate 100 times over this collection. Well, not 100, but if, if this is correlated to the number of elements. So the more elements we have, the more iterations we have. Well, I discussed that, and, they, and, and I got an answer that said, um, well, you know, yeah, that's, that's sloppy language. <laughs> um, we have, you can see it that way that, yeah, obviously, we need some time to visit all the elements. but we reduce the amount of time that we could spend if we iterate once again. So for the second iteration, it becomes cheap. We just have, let me say it that way, not the best wording to specify that. OK, fair enough. Let's look at the code. So let's, um, let's measure that. Let's measure how fast this is. And let's see what the result is. Um, once again, I have a program here. It is just saying, well, I have a size here. The size comes, may come from the command line. 
Um, I initialize a vector with uh, size elements, all be negative, and then I call drop for half of the elements, and then I measure how long it takes to call begin. Just begin. It's important, by the way, if you do that, you have to use the result of begin, otherwise compilers are so smart, it's, they see that it's not used and throw it away. So, let's do that. That's fast. <laughs> um, that's still fast. <laughs> yeah, we have a vector. We have a vector, and we call drop. For a vector, calling drop is just a jump um, to the corresponding element. So that's cheap. So let's, um, let's modify this and say, oh, let's, let's add it later on and say, um, let's, let's initialize a list, std list of int, let's, uh, well, vector has done the job already, so let's initialize a list with um, the, um, how is it called, vector begin, and the vector end, so all the elements from the vector, and then do the same again. So list, copy and paste is the only pro appropriate way to program, I know. I... Oh. Do we have a problem with the initializer? Well, let, hmm. what is the problem here? Hmm. Okay. No, the curly braces are not the problem. Yeah, the good thing with C++ compiler messages is um, once you understand the error, you understand the error message. <laughs> so, so look at that. that some things are is suspicious here. So, uh, uh, passing of the so uh, begin begin is a problem here. And a call here. That's a, okay. Let let's see. Is there something on the right? No. Oh. Oh, discards qualifiers. Do you know what happens when you read discards qualifiers? You have a const problem. Well, or you have a volatile problem, pretty rare. <laughs> so, okay, we have a const problem. So what is the const problem? I'm, I'm sure some, uh, some people know here from what you just saw. What is the const problem here? Oh, begin is caching the value, oh, and that means we modify the view. Oh, so the problem is um, we can no longer pass the range with uh, const. Okay. Let's remove it. And it works. Awesome. Mm, OK, I have a lot of generic code I wrote for 20 years now. So remove all the cons. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to use your code for views. That's what you see here. Or you cannot use it. Well, unfortunately, 
if you now pass a temporary object, um, that will no longer compile because um, an uh, non-const L value reference, the one with the one ampersand, cannot bind to an R value to a temporary object. So to do that, you have to do something we are all familiar with because we are only experts here, but I tell you, four million programmers in C++ are not familiar with, which is this beast. Okay, we just made universal or forwarding references a basic feature for ordinary programmers. Wow. Um, you are happy if you don't have to teach C++. I do. That will be fun. So, of course, I have some questions. So, let's look at the slides again, a little bit what we have. So, first of all, what can happen is this. A programmer has this simple code, just a print function. Um, you can print a container. You can um, then pipe containers, whether it's a list or a vector, into a take view, and that works perfect. Take just the first three elements. You take a drop view, and it works perfect for the vector, but not for the list. <laughs> now, you sit there. Think about a programmer just not so experienced just solving some physical problems, uh, physics problems, what is the right word? Don't know, but people who are not experts and know all the tricky features of C++, and they come to this point of view. Well, you know, a little bit more than one year ago, I was in that situation because I didn't see that coming. So the next thing I tried is, um, what is, if I don't call print, if I do it directly, and it works. <laughs> okay. Good. You know the answer already. The problem is the const here. So how can we fix that? Well, a couple of interesting issues we have. So first of all, um, that's an interesting suggestion I got. I ask a lot. Um, but the, the point is you have to call begin and create something where this is called already, and this should be a view. So here's a trick. You can say, oh, let's, let's create this view and then pass begin and end of this view to a subrange. That's also a view. <laughs> and that subrange now is, um, allows, has a const begin, and um, that works. Good. So next thing we just talked about is use um, the two ampersands. Um, as I said, it's called universal or forwarding reference. It was called universal ref reference until the standard committee decided for whatever reason we call this forwarding reference, although it's not a forwarding reference until you call forward for it. And it's not only used for forwarding, as we see. Uh, it was a perfect name, universal reference, because it can universally refer to both L values and R values without making them const. Things like that happen. If, if the language is not too complicated, we make the terminology too complicated. So, OK. I, when I get older, I have to become wise, I thought. But I'm, I'm more angry. <laughs> OK. Uh, because it's not necessary. OK. So we do that. Um, oh, yeah. OK. Let's, uh, let's do this. Let's, let's in my function. Um, use one thread to uh, print out the elements and another thread to accumulate the elements. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's okay. If you pass a container, that's undefined behavior if you call drop and it's a list. If you call drop and it's a vector, it's OK, because we are calling here in two threads at the same time begin. 
And that's a concurrent iteration. We have a statement in the standard that says, um, even the non-cons begin does not count as a write. It's safe to use it concurrently. In containers, but not for views. So you have undefined behavior here in this code. So in this case, please use const here, const auto ref. So you see the rules beco are becoming pretty easy now. Huh? <laughs> well, OK, do we have other options? Yes. We can use values, call by value, but then passing a container is expensive. We can constrain that and say, no, no, um, pass by value, but we require that it is a view. Then passing a container is an error. Well, that's maybe better, maybe worse than expensive. Um, but then the caller can say, oh, let, can, let me convert the container to a view. <laughs> we have a view for that. That's called all. Take all the elements of this container as a view. OK. Or we overload for containers and views. <laughs> um, so here's um, for views. And then um, let, let me add a print for containers. Containers we want to pass by reference. Oh, there's an interesting problem. If you overload in C++ for reference and values, you should not do that, um, because then sometimes there is no preference of one over the other. Um, so you definitely at least have to say, and this is not for views. So that definitely only one of them is valid. Um, normally, it's OK to say one of them is constrained and the other is not constrained. And then we, if both fit, the more constrained is used. But that does not apply here. So with that, you can, um, depending on what you pass, you call the first or the second print. And it works fine. Good. In any case, OK, we have solved the problem. We cannot use const views. Well, sometimes. Um, now, there's a reason we have const in this language. It protects us. It converts runtime errors to compile time errors. So. How can we bring back constness now, once we have removed it, when we pass a parameter? So that's interesting. So the first thing I tried is I call C begin instead of begin. Well, we have standardized that with C11 just for that purpose. We want to make sure when we iterate over the elements of a collection that the elements are const. Good. Oh. Not available for views. OK, views require, with views you need that, and they don't provide that. Well, we have one view that provides C begin. That's string view, where the elements are always const. <laughs> Sometimes we are funny people when we standardize. And, and you should have been in the discussions I had. I was, I was running from one, uh-huh, OK, interesting, to the next. OK, but you can use, we have something better. We have global functions. You can use std c begin or std ranges c begin. It's a compile time error now here, because we, you see what I do on top. I call std c begin, and then I do an assignment. So that should not compile. Oh, it compiles for views. OK. <laughs> c begin is either not available, and the replacement, the global c begin, is broken. And you know what? Nobody cared. I wrote up papers, and I had to really to fight to, to take, to, to deal with that problem. 
okay, we, we, there was some success. So some success was, yes, it's partially fixed. So in C++23, we will have C begin member, and we will have the std range C begin working, but not std C begin. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, am I close to code of conduct violation? It's okay, guy. Good. I, sometimes I don't understand things. So, I mean, we have this code. We have designed C begin for that reason. C begin is broken for views, and we don't fix it. And I propose it, definitely. It was rejected, my proposal. So here's the learning you have. First of all, don't use std C begin anymore with C++20. That's a good advice, because you know every program is lazy. So that's the first thing they try out. They don't try out the std ranges C begin. But you should do that. We didn't deprecate std c begin, which, but which, which we definitely should do then, at least. OK, so you think that's all? It can't get worse? Never underestimate expert that standardize. Because they understand that all. They say, what's the problem? We know that. OK. If you read this function, well, you might declare the top a little bit different as a template parameter. If you read this function, would you assume that you cannot modify the element? That's a trick question, of course, a trap question. Um, as an expert, you know, it can happen, but you have to do a lot of dirty stuff. Well, let me modify this function a little bit and say, um, let's iterate over elements in a collection that are pairs. So let's declare the element as const autoreference and then print out the first and the second member. Let me use a zip view. This zip view comes with C++23. Zip view, like a zip, put, puts together the first element of two element of two collections and the second element and so on and so on, and makes it a pair. So this is the effect. Good. I immediately have application for that function. Wait with the picture. The next slide is the important one. <laughs> Um, I want to do something special when the first element is 2. So let me write that. Then I want to put a star in front. Cool. I know, you don't make mistakes, but I still make mistakes when I program. I might write one assignment here. You see it coming, huh? <laughs> you think this should not compile. It compiles. That's the effect. So I want to point out that the designers of views have killed const completely. It's not that this const is sometimes ignored by views. It's also that that cons is sometimes ignored by views. For good reasons. There are use cases for that. But how do I teach C++ now? Yeah, and, and when I complain, they say, but, but that was always possible. Yes, of course it was possible. But, you know, it was possible when you 
used objects where the members are references. That's not normal, that's not typical. That's a very special case and a very special thing. And, and everything, everything in your head should say alarm if you see references as members, which are used here. But you don't see them. You just run into this trap as an ordinary programmer. And I think that's not OK. It's not OK to ship this just because it's possible already to ship this as a major, simple to use feature for ordinary programmers. Are we done? No. Const, if you use it, is not propagated. Well, usually you would say, if I declare a collection const, the elements are const. That applies to containers. That applies to arrays. But that's not true for views. All the code above that says, let me call begin or front or the index operator and use an assignment here so modify the element is valid if you pass vector drop three. Well, not always. <laughs> now let's get really funny. Um, only if the view you have operates on an L value, on a range with a name. If it operates on an R value, then const is propagated. Why is somebody doing that? To fix that, your code has to do the following. You as a caller have to say, please, I know you wanted const, but this const has no effect because I pass you a view so let me first convert this vector to a const and then call take or drop or whatsoever and pass it. Uh, and by the way, <laughs> in uh, C++23, we get instood views as const, which you can use even after you have created the view. And with that, you also get an error here. So it's a good thing if you get an error here. That brings me to the question, um, what is the exact type of a view? Well, um, part of the example you just saw was this. You have a function that returns a vector. And um, you can initialize an object with that. OK. And now you say, um, let's pipe this object to drop. So what you get is um, a combination of two views. Once it's a ref view, that's just the wrapper that refers to the container so that we can use the container as a view. And then the real work, so because we want to uh, drop the first two elements, is done by the drop view, which requires that it gets a view, so we do this in direction. Um, otherwise, all the, all the views like drop would be more complicated. So what you get here is a drop view of a ref view of a vector of int. And it looks always very nice if you skip the namespaces. <laughs> but it's that. If you um, use a temporary object, um, you get something different, which is um, then what you, what, you, what you pipe into drop is an R value. So it's about to die. Um, if you follow the original standard, that was invalid code, but that was fixed in C++20, and in C++20, um, they inserted an owning view, which simply moves the temporary object into a view, so you see the view owns the elements and the values and, 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 and the vector, and then a drop view is on top of that. And, and that has the effect that on the left, Unfortunately, ref view propagates not const, but the owning view propagates const. 
Uh, you want to read about that in the C++ standard? That's a problem. There's nothing about owning views in the C++ 20 standard because it was not there when it was done. It was added later as a fix. Um, so where, where can I find C++ 20 as it is now with all the fixes? No way. You can find a document where, all, where you have, in addition, all the C++ 23 features. So we have no document that says, this is C++ 20 with all the fixes. And that's an important fix. It changes a lot. OK. Let me um, summarize a little bit where we are. So before C++ views, I would write a print function this way. Template parameter const C reference, const auto reference the element. Everything is const. Since C++ 20 and C++ 23 now, um, you should do it the following way. <laughs> Take the argument as universal reference, um, the declaration of element, you can do it that way, one way or the other. And then um, you should, on the right-hand side of the colon, use SCD views as const of the collection. <laughs> so fix all your code above to the code below, and it becomes usable for views. You have a task now switching to C++20. You see it? Uh, and please don't use std as const, because the standard committee preferred to confuse you even more because we have an as const that is similar, but not the same. It also makes something const. But it makes the object const, not the elements. So if you use the const here, it will compile, but have no effect. Because as you know, if you make a view const, it has no effect. We need std views as const, because that makes the elements const. Cool, but nasty. The last time we had something cool, but nasty was the two ampersands sometimes being R value references, sometimes being universal references. And we ran into trouble and trouble and trouble and trouble. And we will have the same here. I promise. Are there ways to deal with that code now? So this is a way you can do that. So we can have, uh, we will have in C++23 a new concept that says, um, is, it a, is this range const? But that doesn't mean uh, that really means it has to be const. So this is not true for a range that is not const. So it does not mean it can it use as a const or so. So if it's const, let's do our work. Else, and that's a compile time decision, let's call me again, <laughs> call myself, after I made myself const. <laughs> On the reflector, when this was proposed by Thomas, somebody said, oh, that's a real cool solution of this problem. <laughs> I have another idea of a cool solution of all these problems. Trust me. I really have it. Oh, are we done with the problems? <laughs> I have still time, Jens. OK. More problems to come. So we didn't talk about modifications. So look at this code. We have a vector, and we call print. And then I check out which one of the elements is even. And I create a view with that. I say, my collection pipe into a filter that is even. So call even is a range that only has the even elements of this vector. And then I can use it, for example, simple in a range-based for loop and say, um, each even element, increment 2. And do it again. Everything works fine. Until <laughs> you knew that this would come now. Ah, short break? We need a short break now. Um, not directly, but like, do you have a slide where we can like, read about the screen because there's a bit of an audio delay? Ah, there's an audio delay? Yeah, yeah so we wait. So there's a problem with this code. Um, 
and it would come. So I can drink something. And you think about which problem is coming here. <laughs> also want to have Nico uh, get a drink. So, so everybody's going now. Oh, God. No, 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 no. <laughs> Steady, we're, we're, we're just resetting the screen. That should be fixed in a minute. So you give me an okay or what? Um, I think the okay has to come from the audio people. We will continue the keynote in a minute. Uh oh. Uh -oh. oh, they come back. That's good. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. We can continue? We can continue. We will continue. So here's the solution to the problem. I mean, here's the solution which tells you what problem we have here. Let me increment the value. So not add two. Let me add one. Only the even elements which then became odd elements. So let me do it once. Let me do it twice. Oh. So the second loop says, let's iterate over the even elements of this collection, and it converts a 5 to a 6. Why? We cache, yeah, we cache begin. We don't double check what we cache. I don't, I don't know if, if you see the depth and severity of this problem, which came up with, with, with others when we talked about that. This is officially undefined behavior, already the first one. So. Now, think about major use cases of a filter. Why do you have a filter? You have a filter because you want to find elements that have a predicate to change them so that they no longer fulfill the predicate. That's a very, very, very common use case. So, unfortunately, the use case is broken. <laughs> and it's a runtime error. So we have a statement in the standard for the filter view saying, a modification with a filter view iterator results in undefined behavior if the resulting value does not satisfy the filter predicate. So we care about real world problems. So Patrice came immediately with that example. Um, that means I cannot iterate over a list of monsters and resurrect those who are dead? <laughs> no, that's undefined behavior. Just because we cache. Okay, uh, you can burn the monster, the dead, provided 
they are still dead then. You never know in these monster world, but I didn't. How do you fix that? Well, use views ad hoc. So don't specify them early and use them multiple times. Use them ad hoc. So why do we cache begin then? If we only use them once ad hoc? May I ask this question? You see my problem? Is it, do you want to have more? Sure, here it is. Vector and a list. Let's drop the first two elements. Let's insert a new element. And let's use the view to print out the elements. So this prints out the elements of the vector on the list. Skip, skipping the first two elements, as expected, I would say. Let's insert a few other elements <laughs> and print that out. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> OK. So in the vector, um, we skip now the first two elements. In the list, we skip the first one, two, three, four, five elements, six elements, because we cache begin. <laughs> now here comes the fun part. You can heal this code by creating a copy of the view. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, means a copy of a view has, may have a different state. Blah. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is code. We, we can put it in ex Compile Explorer. This is a working example. This is what we standardize. Now, it gets even worse. Um, may I inspect here after the first statement what the elements are and call print here? Oh, yeah, but the behavior of my code changes. So look at that. And now an early print changes the behavior of this program. So just to make it clear, we have introduced caching. We learn that as a consequence, we should use views ad hoc, so we no longer need caching. And the consequence is that a read statement is no longer a read statement. That whether or not I have a read statement changes the following behavior. And see what, well, see what we have there for values. Oh, no, uh, let, let me change this a little bit more and say, oh, oh, let's use a filter here and say um, that we filter out uh, only the elements that are greater than, than equal. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, sorry. Um, so you see, this has only elements greater than zero, but here you have a zero. Because that was the element we cached. No, that was not the element we cached. Why do, why do we get that? Hmm, okay, wait a minute. Okay, so, um, da, 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 da. so we have, we call print here for the vector. The vector um, da, 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 caches here begin. And then we add a new element, then we have that. But here it's right. So why don't we get here? The three, because we learned that filters cache. Well, they were very smart and said, oh, in this particular situation, we do the following trick. 
When a vector caches begin, it doesn't cache begin, it caches the offset. <laughs> Some people break together in the room. <laughs> OK. Um, yes, that's a feature. That's not a bug. That's a feature. So uh, enjoy predicting what happens if you use a view and you have modification while the view exists. And if we have call reserve, yeah, we get undefined behavior because we might have cached something or used something that is no longer valid, depending on the circumstances, which range, type of range we have, which filter we have, and so on, and so on. Oh my goodness. Again, you fix this, don't do that, don't do that. Never create a view and use it not ad hoc. But then the question is, why the hell do we cache? So we have a couple of idioms we learned when we deal with containers and with arrays. You can iterate if the range is constant. A read does not change behavior. Const makes the elements immutable. CBegin makes the elements immutable. Concurrent iterations are safe, as long as they don't modify, of course. A copy of a range has the same state. All of these idioms are broken with views. And sometimes, only sometimes, sometimes they are always broken. Do you think this is a good design? I have some doubts. I honestly have some doubts. And let me come back to the initial example. It turned out that this is broken. Because we did pass a view to multiple threads. They concurrently call begin. And that is undefined behavior. I tried a lot to discuss that. A lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. I learned that over time, and each time I thought, OK, I accept that, the next problem came. So the problem with, with um, that const for an element no longer works was sent me with a, sub, with a subject, what the fuck? <laughs> we just discussed it last week in Hawaii, and everybody in the room thought that, no, we don't see a problem. Good design. This will come in C23. OK, I have a consequence here. I have a severe consequence here. So we want to point out that the design of the standard views breaks several fundamental idioms that are well known and I really need to teach to beginners. I know, still experts can do a lot of things different. But at the beginning, I have to know something. It's to benefit from caching. We have all the problems you saw. And then we don't propagate cons. And we, that all creates incredible confusion, unnecessary undefined behavior. We compromise cons in a lot of places, really bad and ugly workarounds, and a lot of frustration. Because when I talk to that, I, I've taught that already a couple of times. And, and people are in the middle of, oh, uh, it's so cool. It's such a nice thing. It's ranges, views, great. But should I use that or not? <sighs> Sorry. Is that OK, code of conduct? So the important part is for ordinary programmers. I think C++ standard views are completely broken as a library for ordinary programmers. So you, you can use it. You can make great things of that, but you have to know a lot. And I didn't tell you all the problems. You can read them in the nice book I have. <laughs> Nico, what should we do? I, why did you, why, I got messages, why didn't you say that two years ago? Well, my time is limited. I had to document C17. 
And um, 200 people standardize. And at some time, you, you trust them that they know things like that and, and what is OK for programmers and what, is, what should be expert knowledge and what should be a library for ordinary programmers. I was expecting too much in this time. And yes, don't get me wrong. These are great experts. They are really good people. They really do incredible stuff. But the outcome is a nightmare because a couple of decisions were made wrong, simply wrong. Oh, Nico. Do it better. No, we had to do that. We, had, we ran into this problem and that problem, and, and that was what we needed for a solution. You know, the problem is, I think, if you, if you work, if a couple of people work for five years on views, all these problems become normal and say, yeah, we know that. That's, we don't need that. And, and that's why it is so important that we include, I would have loved to have that t-shirt, include beginners in the standard committee. This is... I don't know if, if you agree with me, but I hope you at least see the problem I have with that library. Could we do better? Yes. With the work they have done, the Rangers folks have done great work. And they also came up now with solutions for dealing with cons, etc. With the work they have done, we could have made it a lot better. But somebody has to do the work. I did. I started to work on a system of use for C++ that just work. Started is the important point here. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that we have usability, safety, predictability, performance. Iterating over the view is always stateless. You can always iterate when the view is cons. You can iterate concurrently. Read iterations have no impact on later code. We respect the idioms of containers and errors. We honor constness. We propagate constness always, not only for owning views. A copy of a view is always, has always the same state as the source. More consistency. Um, in a couple of places. So look at that. This is how you can use Bell views. The name has a nice feature because you can say, instead of writing SCD here, you write Bell there. And with Bell views, you don't have the problems you saw. So you can switch from one to the other. And the design is that you can combine both standard views with bell views. That's also the idea. It's only the views. It's not a new range library. Only the views. This problem is solved. You can resurrect a dead monster now. This one is no undefined behavior anymore. Dealing with multiple strats to read, iterate over views. Every view is fine. And const is propagated. If you make a view const, the elements are const always. You can still copy the view, and then the const is removed. And of course, this is also fixed. 
So Bellevue's will not have this strange behavior that if you early define a view and you have some modifications, that suddenly the view does not work anymore. So you can use these views more than just ad hoc. And it's really fun that standard views have the power of lazy evaluation. So late use is natively supported. And then, due to caching, it's, it's broken. <laughs> yeah, you can write great code with that. You can say, well, let's define a view and then put, pass it around. And sooner or later, and if it's 10 hours later, you can use the view and it still works. When I said, this is a use case to those who standardize the range side, no, that's not a common use case. You shouldn't do that. OK, but it's possible. It would be better to do that. And the price is not necessarily less bad, worse performance. Because, as you know, if we iterate only once, all the caching is, is, is a waste of time. So if you want to do that, there's a feature called eager begin. So you just put in explicitly an element in the pipe saying, and at this time, please call begin immediately so that we cache it. By the way, that's not anything invented by me. I think um, an explicit caching filter uh, of you was already there in ranges V3. I don't know why it's not in the standard anymore. This is an experiment. But the experiment is so far that we have a lot of support there already. You can find it at GitHub. So it's GitHub, Yosutis, Bellevues. It's, it's not even better. <laughs> it's a, this is a request for help. I think it's time that we fix views and make them great because the concept is great. I need your help for code, for tests, for reviews. Because sooner or later, I have to document C++23. But we can already see how simple and safe the views are. All the code you have seen with Bellevue works already. And I don't promise to solve all the problems of C++ and the world, no. A lot of problems are suddenly gone. The code uses um, C++ 20 ranges, so thanks for all the work with ranges. So this is not a criticism on the ranges and views in general. It's just that we have made fundamental wrong decisions at a certain point of the path. And then, for some reason, those who made these decisions couldn't escape. Um, and with uh, what they came up with, the const fixes, I use that a lot. I in that code. So we can have a short look into that. So so this is the current state. Excuse me, it's not very, very, very great already. Um, you have seen the motivation, a very, very very um, sorrow motivation of this library. Here's a shorter one, and with a couple of key examples, so how to use it, and then a couple of key examples that explain where we fix existing broken code. And then um, the design decisions, the principles we have, and the status, the statuses are that I have the basic views of C++20. So ref view, owning view, all, and all T, which is the underlying um, mechanism to switch between all, ref view and owning view. Then drop view and drop, take view and take, filter view and filter, transform view and transform, drop by view and drop by. And because I also make things, want to make things more consistent, we have a view where we don't have uh, an adapter for and that is sub range. So I also provide a sub view for that so that you can um, more consistently use all the views. So ideally, if you teach 
the whole system of views, you never see the real types. But it was not possible because we had in the count standard, we have no consistent support of this principle. Yeah, a lot of things are open. Tests are already there, but of course not complete. Um, only, only one or two people have looked at there. Hannes is one of them. Thanks, Hannes. Is he here? No, maybe. And um, it's um, cold. I, I don't want to write that. I didn't want to fix thread with jthread. I didn't want to fix broken atomics. But it's time to fix this. It's time to fix standard views. I welcome and a lot of help, please. I think we can have something great. Look at that, contact me, help me to make this complete. I think it's worth it. If not, tell me. If you think it's worth it, I would get, like to get a big round of applause. That's it. Thank you. Any questions? Oh, guy. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> right. Um, OK, first, happy birthday. Nico is 60 on Friday. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> on Saturday. Saturday. <laughs> so, yeah, congratulations. Thank um, you. <laughs> Secondly, great keynote, actually. That was really good. And I thank you for the clear explanation of problems that we have with views. Um, and we were in Hawaii. So I'm on the standard committee, just to be clear. Uh, we were in Hawaii last week, and we were looking at lots of things like this. Um, I think that actually the problem is that constant propagation. So 20 years ago, um, I wrote a game. Or I didn't write a game. A bunch of us wrote a game called Rome Total War. And constant propagation was the biggest problem that we had by far, by a country mile. <laughs> and surely, isn't all of this that you're describing just a, a different expression of constant propagation failure? And that as we learn that const does not propagate through objects in the same way this is what's happening here, and that the thing to learn is that const is limited in its application. We can discuss about the world and, and that means a programming language where we have different idioms. And one would be not to propagate constants. That has a lot of consequences, a lot. I think we agree on that. Oh, yeah. So I think the answer on that is, the easy answer on that is consistency. I want to have it consistent, and it's possible. And I want to, and, and just to be clear, I don't say pointers should propagate constants. Mm. I'm, talk, I'm talking about collections, and, and we should make it very clear that a collection type, a range, has a different semantics than a pointer. We have problems with that because raw arrays can be used as pointers, we know that. And then, uh, but but here, um, I think it's uh, important that we, um, that we have it consistent. And especially as we have existing generic code and existing understanding of what a const means for a collection. And I think based on that, we should go on with this consistency and not surprise people. We can surprise them, but not with the same API then I would suggest that we come up with something different. So your suggestion then is that const should propagate not through indirect types, but it should propagate through collections. Well, first of all, I, I don't say const should always propagate. That, let me be very clear on that. Okay. I, I, all I say and all we implement in Bellevue is um, if um, a view is const, the elements are const, whatever that means. If there is a uh, shared pointer, the underlying object is still not const. It's just that we have it one level down. And I want to have it everywhere the same. 
in containers, in owning views, and in referring views. And that's not the case now. Spans? That is interesting that you ask for spans. I, I was thinking about that, and so far, I, I did not decide to implement span. I think span is something different, so I can live with span having different rules. Um, it, yeah, so I have no clear answer on that. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. and, and, and there's a reason span is so far not in the, in, in the, in the Bellevue's list. Yeah, thank yeah. you very much. Thank you, Guy. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so I have a very practical question, uh, it, since you mentioned the net. So standard ranges, uh, concepts, will work with references, will work with elderly reference? It's like vector reference is a forward range. Uh, but, and forward iterator, standard forward iterator, and if I have int star ref, that will be a forward iterator. But standard regular is not applicable to int, uh, int reference, for example. So my question is, when you write concepts, do you think you should remove references from them? And so like make concepts work with references or not? What's your opinion? I have no opinion on that. I'm very, very thankful for those who came up with, this, with the concepts we have in the standard. Um, there was big design behind and based on the experience of implemented ranges and they have they have made have had to make all these trade-offs, and so far, I didn't see a severe problem, but something that was surprising. Um, so I'm not able to answer that that question. So I would have to think about that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have one practical question. You said there are some solutions to some of those problems. Is there somewhere a list of what type of ranges to use and what we can use, what we should not use? And do you have some, yes, some hints on that? Well, first of all, views. Ranges is fine. Uh, views are the sorry, issue. Sorry, yes, views. Then, um, <sighs> you can use them all. You have to know the price. So, and, and it's not easy to understand the price. So, um, let me show you something. Where is it? So, this is pure advertisement. Thanks for the question. I paid him 100 bucks to ask that question. Um, I have a section in this book. It's called View Types in Detail. And the idea is that for each and every view, you see I have here on top a list of uh, the major aspects such a view has. So can it be created with a factory or which, which factories and what do they do? What is the element type? Is it a reference or is it a value? What is the category, that re the resulting category? Um, is it a science range? Uh, is it a common range? That means, is it, is it, um, are the types of begin and end the same? Um, does it cache? Um, is it cons interable? Does it propagate constness? That, 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 that alone is something you need. And once you need that and you know that, of course you can deal with that. The problem, of course, starts if you say, well, um, I have a vector. Then I take a filter, then I take uh, another view, and another view, and another view, and, and you have a chain of 10 views, and you really have a problem to find out the resulting attributes, because each and every filter in front might have an impact on the behavior of the filter behind. So still, even if we have bell views, we have issues. But, um, yeah, use them all as you like. You can also you know how to use a filter now. Yeah. The, the, the question is, as always, do I remember next week? <laughs> and the reason is, the answer is, 
Everybody who programs with views has to buy this book. <laughs> you got my account. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot. Yeah, but, no, but of course, we, we need documentation. And the problem is, um, that's one problem in the, in the standardization. Those who standardize have an idea how to use things, but they don't come up with documentation. That's, for some reason, now my part, as Scott Myers went out of the business, and, um, and others write good books too here. Oh, my goodness. So they sit here. And, um, but um, it's not part of standardization to document how to use that. And to be honest, sometimes we don't know how to use that. We learn it the hard way, like here. Hey, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so it's a pretty grim picture of the standard uh, views, right? Uh, no doubt we can build a better library, right? Uh, like better views, I don't know. Uh, but how much of the standard views we can actually fix in the standard without having something like ranges 2 or better views or something? I want something in the standard that addresses all of your concerns, especially with beginners, uh, without, well, breaking it before we even use it. So one thing Guy didn't tell you, that last week in Hawaii, they fixed the range-based for loop, which was broken for 30 years. I was driving that. That's why the applause comes. And it took me so much time to fight for that. So, of course I know, well, well I, I, I said something about ranges again and again, and I know, I know the reaction. And currently those who decide will say, are you crazy? They might hate me, I don't know, they might, at least nobody is happy if I come and say, well, your work for three years is broken. <laughs> for some people, great, but we have a problem. And then we have the problem that once we have something in the standard, we really need good support to fix things. So I could imagine that it's pretty easy, for example, to remove caching. But is there a will to do that? I will not even try to find that out. I will definitely not. No. No way. So that's a problem. We could do a lot. And the question is, of course, then, what is broken? When we fix the range-based for loop, we can at least theoretically see some broken code. And then broken by not compiling, runtime error, or performance gets worse. And the same question is here. So if somebody uses a view, and um, then we remove caching, and it uses a view 1,000 times, then there's a problem. We would even have a workaround, but we have to fix the code. So it came down at the end. The fix of the range-based for loop came at the end down. Do we want to do all the million of basic programmers a favor to fix the range-based for loop, risking that some experts have to fix tricky code? If that would be a general guideline in standardization, I could see fixes here in the existing code base. But you know, it, it would have to start that all those who have done the work listen to me one or two hours to this talk. And just listen to me and not immediately say, no, begin as fast. Um, we have no threat problem. That's what the authors tell me as an answer. It, are you sure that we have a severe problem with caching? That's what I get back. In this, in this team. Uh, there's another way to fix that. Send bug reports over bug reports. So you should have done that with the range-based follow-up, because one problem was they said, oh, we never get bug reports with that. And, and I, I know a, lot, a couple of people who run into that bug, they say, yeah, well, usually, so C++ is so complex, I could not imagine that I am the, not the problem. <laughs> that says something about where we are with C++. So I don't think there's a way to do that. I think this will be, maybe it's a, it's a, it's a library that's used. We will have standard views, and that's it. That's it. Too late. Thank you.
Nico. Oh, Nico. <laughs> oh. I have a few questions mm -hmm. from the online audience. Mm -hmm. So quick. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, given the growing number of problems and inconsistency in the standard library, do you think it is time for the standards committee to consider breaking revision? I think it's time to switch to a new programming language. <laughs> oh, OK. Wait. We talk about something that takes years and centuries. I think we have learned enough. We have made enough mistakes. We have adopted a lot. And there's a reason, I think, that we see new, new things evolve. Nobody knows what will happen in 10 or, five, or 15 years or so. But I think it's time to come up with something better. That doesn't mean that we will not have C++ in 20 years. We still have Fortran. Mm -hmm. So, no, don't worry. I, I always have a problem that in the committee, some people think C++ is my baby and you should not criticize it. So sometimes my talks are rejected at conferences with the argument too much criticism of C++. Yeah, honestly. I, I'm not sure I can have this talk at a conference like CPPCon. And um, I think it's time. We have 4 million programmers. Yeah, support them. But also say, hey, we, we did the best we could. We have problems. We have more and more problems because we have mistakes. We have a problem with backward compatibility. And, 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 and there comes a point with, where the problems really become big. And we have to talk about backward compatibility. And a lot is going on. Those who have been in Hawaii know that. Because more and more people say C++ is no longer a safe language. And in, in, the, in our world, we need a safe language. And um, this is also not so safe, I think, <laughs> what is standardized there. So, yeah, we need something better, sure. So, isn't a view basically a range over specialized iterators? What's the difference of SDL views to boost iterator range and the corresponding transforming filtering adapters? Does the boost solution exhibit similar problems? I can't say anything about that. I don't know. Okay. Boost Why is the cache begin not implemented with a mutable member? As far as I know, that was discussed. Actually, I don't know the answer. Okay. Uh, I think there are a couple of good answers for that, so you run into other problems. Um, please also note that we would only solve the cons problem. We would not solve the problem we have because we cache. And then later on, if you use the view, um, you should not use the same begin. You have to start from scratch again. So only we would have a partial solution of the problems we have. OK. That's it? Oh, that was easy. Oh, thank you. Hello. Hello. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I, I, while listening to your talk uh, and uh, about all, all, all problems that you discussed, most of the things I've seen, uh, from, from my perspective, it appears that uh, our Pro, uh, are related to problem with backward compatibility. For example, if you use uh, ranges, I mean views in a way they are meant to be used with pipes and filters and so on, uh, and then combine that with the old fashioned uh, range based for loop, then you've got the problems with caching and everything that you explained. But I wonder what if instead of writing our four based uh, printing uh, function or or some other processing, if instead of that I write a lambda and use it as a filter, so it's so-called filtering lambda, would I then have the same problems with the caching and uh, uh, dangling and everything you explained in your uh, talk today? I'm not one of these smart guys that can understand your question without seeing code and feeling it. So we can talk about that offline. And, um, but what I learned, if I learned one thing in my career with C++, it's 
um, a cool idea is nothing until you implement it and, and you see all the problems and you really come up to some pain points and corner cases. So it was also that we thought, um, for example, could we give up borrowed ranges, if you know what that is, with bad views? And we pointed, we, we, we found, no, we couldn't. So, yeah, the devil is in the detail. That is always the case. So, yeah, there are a lot of simple answers probably, but then the work starts. Yeah, but uh, I just meant if we just stick to a one idiom, for example, if whenever use, using views, if you just stick to idioms of using lambdas that are passed to filters. And yeah, we could do that. Views, uh, in other ways. Ah, we could do that, but then we should make sure that existing code cannot be used for views. Okay. So views have a, have a different uh, landscape or a different context where they are, which on the other hand, uh, means that we have some problems because, um, of course, it has a, creates a great benefit to use existing generic code also with views. So it's an interesting trade-off. I'm not sure which one is better. I mean, I, what I really want to, would like to avoid is something like in Java that we have um, 10 libraries for each problem. Um, so, yeah, there's no easy answer. <laughs> Thank you. So that's a consultant's answer. <laughs> uh, to quote lots of people, this isn't a question, more of a comment. Um, tomorrow evening, we've got an AMA with Inval Levy. Um, most people might not realize that she's the chair of the Ranges study group for the committee. So, Oh, I didn't know that. There may be some interesting questions to be asked then. I will not be there, I, but I, because I, I really don't want to discuss that until I know that the Rangelets Committee is ready for this discussion. And that means, because we, we really had not the best communication when we talked about that. Um, one problem was that it took me so long to come up with this talk. So to say, I understand in, in the whole deepness how things are combined. And probably I overlooked something, and I was later on say, oh, maybe I was wrong. But um, yeah, but good. We should work on everything. Thanks, Nico, again, for persisting with pointing out all these difficulties in the standard and never getting tired of it. it seems. I get tired, I can't <laughs> tell you. <laughs> the, the big question I don't expect you to have an answer to is how in the future we can prevent these, yeah, fuck ups. And um, it seems like the more we uh, steer or in looking forward to a new feature in the C++ standard, everybody was excited to get views and ranges in the C++ 20. Yeah. So nobody wanted to say, no, let's stop that. Uh, so I, I propose to remove concepts, and uh, not uh, con con contracts, and it and was it accepted. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it's worked, but yeah. I think contracts is not a feature like 90% like of the C++ developers were looking forward to. But views and ranges was something that was so much promoted because it took years yeah. to get it along, and then in the end, it fails, in, okay. and it's not usable, as it seems. So it's, it's really interesting, and I thought a lot about that and discussed that with others. Um, at first, standardization should standardize existing practice, and we violate that rule. We, we design coroutines on the fly, we design modules on the fly, we design views well, it's three years old, and, and that's the fun part. Views and ranges were three years or four years old. Right? I don't know when Eric Niedler started with that. And then, um, but, but, but there's nothing, nothing better than we need support by the compilers and then experience what goes on there. But to get support by the compilers, the compilers have to know that what they do is, is work they're, they don't regret. <laughs> so it has to be standardized. So the best model I have in mind is to say, when we come up with something like this, then for one or two releases, we stop the guarantee for backward compatibility. So we say, 
views are in. But don't complain until C26 if you have to modify your code if you use it. That is the best model I can see. Because we have better standards, file system was an example, and we, we got some problems in the standard because people don't look at that, including me. I have enough to do to look at, at what is standardized. So I have no better, and maybe, you know, when we started 25 years ago with standardization, well, not we, uh, others, but I, I was there when the first standard in 1998 was um, published and voted. We came together. We had no mobile phones, no internet, no laptops. So everybody who came there had printed out everything on paper, the whole standard, and then we discussed. Today, our speed is incredible better. But I think we are too fast. I honestly think we are too fast. Except, of course, the things I want to have in. <laughs> that's too slow. That's, yeah. Thanks. But that's, yeah. OK. <laughs> that's it. Do you want to say something, Jens? Or? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Nico. That was a great keynote. And um, it's 12 now, so the lunch should be ready outside. So if you are hungry, go and have something to eat and something to drink. And we will be back with a normal program at, I think, starting around 1 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs>